Please be seated. You sounded wonderful. We're getting back to our roots. Unfortunately, Kent forgot to pay Tristan and Heather this week, so they're on strike. We hope to have the guitar and the piano back soon, drown out my poor singing. We are very pleased this morning to have uh, Dr. Brian Biedebach. For those of you who have been here for quite some time, he has been here before. He comes with his wife, uh, Anita. He is, pretty sure it's Anita. I have it on my notes here. Yes, okay. Second guess myself. My wife will tell you that I'm not great with names. He is a graduate of the Master's Seminary. He is uh, an elder at Grace Community Church where he uh, leads a fellowship group, which is a giant Bible study, bigger than our church, called Steadfast. He's also a so or assistant professor of pastoral ministry at the Master's Seminary. He has four children. Are all four here? Mm -hmm. Yes. He has four children, Amy, Bradley, Benjamin, and Allison. And he has family here in the area in McKinney. His sister Sharon is here, who just waved, and she, I think, has her daughter Brianna. Yes, okay, perfect. So Brian was gracious enough to come. He's gonna spend some time here with his family, and he's going to be in the, the Gospel of John as we continue our study in John chapter two. I invite you at this time to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2. As you're turning there, I'll just say it is a pleasure to be back here. I think it was about a year ago that I was here around this time. It's a real treat for me to come. My sister is here with her family. My brother also lives in Allen. So uh, it's, uh, we, you know, we grew up in Southern California. We grew up in a small town called Seal Beach, just a few blocks from the ocean. Both my brother and my sister have immigrated to Texas. And my brother has fully just taken on the culture. He drives a truck now. He's got a star on his house. He speaks with a Texas accent. We grew up in California. I spent 19 years in Africa. I don't have an African accent. I don't understand it. You guys are a very influential people. This is a very influential state. But what a joy, what a privilege to be here. Thank you. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter two. I'm gonna go ahead and read beginning in John chapter 2, verse 1, down to verse 12, which says this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servant who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. When the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, and his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Let's just pray again. Our Father God, how grateful we are for this opportunity to turn to your word. Teach us, we pray. May your name be exalted and glorified during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Is this, is this one giving me feedback here? I put this there. Is that all right? Okay. All right. I read an article recently about a discovery that has been made in Australia. Apparently, according to the article anyway, scientists declare that they have found the oldest rock known to man. 
the oldest rock. I don't know how they found this rock. It was uh, an ancient crystal, apparently. Uh, it's less than a millimeter wide. It's 400 micrometers, micrometers, micrometers. It's about the width of four human hairs, but they found it. And scientists have studied this crystal's chemistry. They use a new technique called atom probe tomography. They image a single atom of lead and they determine the isotope ratio. They came to the conclusion from doing that process, which I don't really understand what that involves, but they, they came to the conclusion that this crystal fragment is 4.375 billion years old. And one of the articles I read said plus or minus 6 million years. So we'll give them a little latitude. 4.375 billion. I guess that's pretty amazing because they think that the Earth is only 4.5 billion years old. And so according to them, this is the oldest rock fragment ever found. You want me to use this one instead? You want to? Okay. All right. Of course, all of this is based off of the Big Bang Theory, uh, the theory of evolution as well. One article I read said that this fragment um, came about in the Earth's, uh, or said, said also based off of this fragment, it was pretty amazing what they're claiming here, based off of the discovery from this Earth's fragment, Sometime in the first 600 million years of the Earth, the Earth was bombarded by meteors. It took a big hit from one object the size of Mars, which led to the formation of the moon. It's amazing what they can find from one crystal smaller than four hairs. Um, who knew what isotope ratios of a tiny rock could tell us about the Earth and the moon? One of the problems when you start reading scientific articles where they use dating, whether that be carbon dating or so forth, is that they have no way of determining the age of something if something was created to look older than it really was. For example, let's just suppose that you and I could get in a time, let's say that Herb's house here was a time capsule, a time machine that we could go back to any time we wanted, and let's say we went back to the Garden of Eden, and we saw Adam, and let's say that we took some doctors with us, some medical doctors, and we took him to Adam two days after Adam was created, and we said, can you give him a physical examination and tell us how old he is? And so they measure his wrist, and they measure his arms, and they, they measure his height, and they take, get a scale, and they get his weight, and they, they say, based off of our scientific knowledge, this man is approximately 20, 30 years old. Some, somewhere they, they come in there, and we say, actually, he's only two days old. They say, impossible. No way that Adam could be only two days old. Well, actually he is. He was created from the dust of the ground. This is what our, our, the Bible tells us. Well, you see, science is only possible to make observation. Observation that is repeatable. Observation that comes out with uh, the same results again and again and again. And since creation hasn't been repeatable for the most part, it's really difficult for anyone to go back and say, well, science has proved it wrong, or science has proved it right, or whatever, because science observes what can be done again and again and again and again. And you can take man's wisdom about what he's discovered, or you can take God's wisdom about what he's revealed. You're going to have to believe some of it by faith. When we come to the story this morning, it's a story of creation. It's a story where something was made out of something else without the normal ingredients that you would expect for that wine to have. Generally speaking, creation is not a repeatable, observable uh, uh, event, but this morning we have an opportunity to hear an eyewitness account of a creation event that led him to certain conclusions about creation and the creator. And in John 2, verses 1 through 12, we're going to see three scenes that really will direct your attention to the Lord over creation. Three scenes that should direct our hearts and minds to see who is Lord over creation. And the first scene is that Jesus recognized a dilemma. 
Jesus recognized a problem or a dilemma in verses one through four. Let's take a look again at verse one. On the third day, I just want to stop there. John uh, begins in chapter two with the words, on the third day, he has been writing about the first week that he met Jesus. The first week that the disciples met Jesus. He's giving a, an eyewitness account. He's saying, in, in effect, I remember the very first week I met Jesus. And as he opens his gospel, he opens it with a discourse about Jesus, and then he starts describing Jesus and how the very first week that he called his disciples. And day one, John the, baptized, John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan. Day two, John the Baptist sees Jesus and declares him to be, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John chapter 1, verse 29. Then in John chapter 1, verse 35, we have day three. John the Baptist sends Andrew and John, John who's not named here, but John who's the disciple who's writing this account. John, he sends them to go to Jesus. In day four, we have in chapter 1, verse 43, Jesus calls Philip, and then Philip tells Nathaniel. Three days after that, chapter 2, verse 1, three days later. So this takes us to the seventh day of the first week when the disciples met Jesus. Three days later, there was a wedding in Cana. Now, weddings were quite different than weddings today. Uh, in, in, there were three stages to a Hebrew wedding. The first stage didn't involve the couple at all. It involved the fathers. The fathers would meet. They would discuss the arrangement, whether it would be a good arrangement, whether they wanted to commit to it. And they decided and they agreed upon it, and then it would happen. The second stage of the wedding was called the betrothal, and there was actually a ceremony, and a rabbi would show up, and, and the young groom would say to his bride, he would, he would be bet become betrothed to her in front of the presence of a small group of people, family and friends and, and, and uh, relatives and a rabbi, and he would say this, he would say to his bride, Behold, you are consecrated unto me, you are betrothed to me, you are a wife unto me. And it was a legally binding ceremony. In fact, even though the wedding would not be, the marriage would not be consummated, even though they would not actually have a wedding celebration for several months, even up to a year later, uh, while things were being prepared for that and while the young man was getting ready to become his, his own uh, home provider, um, during that time, even though it would be some, some gap. If he died during that time, she would be considered a widow. If they decided to call it off, they would have to get a formal divorce. So the legally binding part happens during that declaration. But stage three was the wedding celebration. And on that day, many, time, many times, months, a year later, uh, there would be various things that would happen. One was a ceremonial bath for the bride. She would, she would take a ceremonial bath, maybe in a bathhouse with other ladies, uh, preparing, getting her all dolled up, but, but symbol, symbol, symbolizing purity for the wedding ceremony. Um, and at a certain stage, she would be waiting at her home, and the groom would come with his men. And they would come to acquire her and to escort, escort her to the groom's father's home where the celebration would take place. And part of that ceremony there would be he would present his bride to his father. The father was responsible then for the wedding celebration. And these could last up to a week. And there would be much drinking and eating and dancing and joy celebrating the formation, according to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, of a new family unit. And so... In a rural wedding like this, a wedding in Cana, we're not exactly sure where it was, but approximately uh, archaeologists have said that there was a Cana that was approximately nine miles from Nazareth, which would explain why uh, all of them would be invited, those disciples from that area. It was a rural area. Rural weddings often invited everybody who wanted to come, everybody who was in the area, everybody from a certain radius. It appears as though some have suggested that perhaps Mary was part of the planning committee since she's so involved and concerned when things don't seem to go right. But we do notice in verse 2 that Jesus' disciples were invited. We have Jesus, Simon Peter, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, and John. Here they are together. 
On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. That's the dilemma. Mary goes to Jesus. Notice she does not go to her husband. She does not go to Joseph. Many have suggested that it is very possible and even likely that Joseph has passed away. The last time we have heard about Joseph was when Jesus was 12. He's now about 30. So 18 years have passed. We also have no further mention of Jesus' sisters, who would have very likely been married by that time, his younger half-sisters. He has younger half-brothers who are with him on this occasion. At least they're mentioned here. His sisters may have been there. And it's very possible that Mary was relying on Jesus, had been relying on him for some time. In one place, Jesus is referred to as the carpenter, not the carpenter's son. And so it seems as though maybe he took over his dad's business and Jesus was actually uh, there the, as the oldest son, the one who would be obligated to take care of his mother. Indeed, later in John's gospel, when Jesus is on the cross, he commends his mother to John for John to take care of her. And so it seem, seems that though, though she relied upon him, and so she comes to him with her issue. And you read different commentaries, there's much speculation about what Mary was asking Jesus. She says to him, in verse 3, they have no wine. Now, on one side, some people say, well, she had no expectation at all. She was just mentioning to him, they have no wine. That doesn't seem to be accurate because Jesus responds in verse 4, he says to her woman, which isn't a term that a son would refer to her mom, his mom necessarily, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a derogatory term. It wasn't, you know, I don't want my kids to say, woman, uh, honey, can you clean your, please please clean your room? Woman, what does this have to do with me and you? It, it doesn't seem like a normal uh, address that a son would make to a mother, but it was a respectful term. It, it was equivalent to what in the South young men would probably say, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and it could be that Jesus is signifying that his ministry is taking off, that he's treating her no longer as a... She, she has to transition from trusting into him as a savior. But he, he, he addresses her with a respectful term, and he calls her woman, and then he says, what does that have to do with us? So if she's not really asking him anything, then his response seems unwarranted. On the other extreme, some have suggested that she was asking for a miracle. That, and they have all these ideas that Jesus was this child who did all these miracles left and right. and She knew all about him and she's just make this water into wine. But that doesn't seem to be what she was asking him because down in verse 11, it says very clearly, this was the beginning of his signs. We don't even know from this story if Mary actually knew that the miracle took place. She knew that wine was provided. Did she know where it came from? She certainly knew about the virgin birth. She certainly knew about what the angel Gabriel had told her, and she had pondered those things, and she had a son who lived a perfect and sinless life. So there was a unique mother-son relationship here, but there's nothing in the text to suggest that she was asking for a miracle. The most likely option is that Mary, who was most likely a widow by now, relied on her older son. He, he, she went to him for help. It's possible she might even heard that recently John the Baptist had said to him, Behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. But her main concern was not trying to demonstrate that her son was the Messiah. Her main concern was not trying to draw attention to Jesus. Her main concern was that the families of the groom, the families of the, especially the family of the groom, might be disgraced because they had run out of wine so early in the celebration. There was not enough wine for the event that would probably last several more days. And at first glance, it looks like Jesus is going to do nothing. Well, men, what does this have to do with us? Literally, what to me and you? And then he says, my hour has not yet come. 
Now, as you study the Gospel of John, and I know you're going through the Gospel of John, this is one of those sub-themes that begins here and carries out through the book. And I'm gonna, we're going to take a little peek ahead because this is one of the, those beautiful threads that weaves its way through the Gospel of John about the hour. Which hour is he talking about? Take a look at John 2, 4. He says, my hour has not yet come. Turn with me to John chapter 7, verse 30. John chapter 7, verse 30. In John chapter 7, verse 30, Jesus is about to be grabbed here, and it says in verse 30, So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Again, John brings this point out about his hour. Turn with me now to John chapter 8, verse 20. Just one chapter away from John chapter 7. John chapter 8, verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. You read this, and you keep on pondering about this as you're reading through the gospel. His hour had not come, chapter 2. His hour had not come, chapter 7. His hour had not come, chapter 8. When does it come? Turn with me to John chapter 12, verse 23. John chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus answered and said, Jesus answered saying, the hour has come for what? For the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus had just been anointed in preparation for his death. And he starts to tell his disciples, the hour has come. John 12, verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. For what hour? The hour of crucifixion. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were with his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And finally, John 17, verse 1, in his prayer. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. What is this hour? The hour was the hour that Jesus would be glorified. The hour would be the, the hour of his sacrificial death on the cross ordained by God. Committed by men, but ordained by God. Not only the sacrifice on the cross, but his death and his burial and his resurrection. Ultimately, his glorification that Jesus Christ, the one who came and lived a perfect life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned, therefore he never had to die. Yet he allowed himself to be crucified. And what John is pointing out by using this phrase, the hour, the hour, the hour, is that Jesus was in control of the hour in which he would die. And he did not want it to happen too prematurely. And so his mother asks him to do something. He refers to his hour saying, if I am public about who I am, mom, they're going to want to kill me prematurely, and I have three years of ministry to carry out here. So he commits what is really a semi-public miracle, because very few people actually witnessed it, though many benefited from it. My hour has not yet come. Jesus Christ is sovereign over all things. He is not only Savior, but he is the sovereign God. It's one of the sub-themes of John's gospel that you may believe, John chapter 20, verse 31, that he is, that he is the Son of God. That you may believe. Jesus is sovereign, but there's, there's another aspect to it here. Not only is he sovereign, back in John chapter 2, Jesus cares. He is not only the sovereign God incarnated in the flesh, but he cares. He honors his mother. He cares about what she cares about. He cares about things that, from an eternal perspective, may seem trivial. 
whether or not one family 2,000 years ago ran out of enough drink at a wedding ceremony. He cares. He's the sovereign God, and he cares, which leads us to something strange happening between verses 4 and 5 and leads us to a second scene in the creation event here that will direct your attention to the Lord over creation. Not only did he recognize a dilemma, but Jesus responded to that dilemma in verses 5 through 10. Jesus responded to that dilemma. Take a look at verse 5. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now it seems like you're missing something. Wait a minute, what happened here? I'm not sure. Did Mary not hear him? His hour had not yet come. What does this have to do with us? Whatever he tells you, just like a mother. I'm just not going to respond. I'm just going to, I know something needs to happen. Whatever he tells you, do it. Whether it was her motherly in, 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 instinctive idea, this intuition, this idea that ah, something's got to happen. I'm relying upon him. He will honor me. Or whether it was a look that was given and she knew. Whatever happened here, she knew that she could leave it in his hands. Verse 6. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Servants here are, we're not slaves. This is not the common word for slaves, doulos. This is, this is the word where we get the word deacon from. These are, these are servers. They could have been actually helpers who knew the wedding party that were serving. But Mary had said, whatever he says, you do it. They were ready to serve. Jesus looks around and he sees these six large stone water pots for cleansing. We, we have, archaeologists have discovered some of these from antiquity, from the first century. Uh, the, the Hebrews believed that stone water pots were purer than clay ones because they were less permeable, and for some reason they were used only stone ones for cleansing. And the Jews were very big about cleansing. You may remember in Mark chapter 7, it talks about them cleansing. They would buy something in the market, their pots and their pitchers and their bowls, and they would come home and they would cleanse it ceremonially in a water, in a, in a, in a, with purified water, with ceremonially clean water. Um, the Jews would wash their hands. At one stage, they asked Jesus why he and his disciples did not follow their traditions of washing hands. It wasn't that he wasn't, was opposed to cleanliness, but they had a tradition where they would take a pitcher of water, hold their hand up, and then pour the water on their hand, flowing it over, not because they were aware of bacteria that might be on their hand, but because they would then walk around with both hands in the airs, in the air saying, uh, I'm ceremonially clean because I have followed the tradition of ceremonial cleansing. We look at this and we think uh, I'm going into surgery, but a, a, a real fastidious Jew in the first century might walk around until his hands were completely dry. And then, don't, I'm not going to touch you. They asked Jesus why he didn't follow their traditions. And Jesus said, why do you not follow the word of God to keep your traditions? And confronted them about not honoring their parents. In this home, there were six large stone water pots. Six large pots that had been hewn out of stone that were used for ceremonial cleansing. We're not sure whether they had some water in and they just topped them off or whether they emptied the water that might have been in them and filled them all the way up. But the servants went and got water. They drew water from a well and they came and filled them up, up to the brim. A small detail there in verse 7, but it proves that Jesus didn't add anything to the giant jars when nobody was looking. 120 to 180 gallons of water, an enormous amount. Look at verse 8. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. 
When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, he then serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. What's being described here was the custom of how to do a wedding on the cheap. If you wanted to save money at your wedding, you brought out the good wine first, and people would get drunk off the good wine. And when they were inebriated, and less likely to tell the difference between good wine and bad wine, you would bring the cheap stuff out later, and everybody would remember how good the wine was at your wedding. Some people get really hung up on this passage. In fact, the words drunk freely literally mean to become drunk. How could Jesus' first miracle involve a story in which someone mentions people becoming drunk? In fact, in Ephesians 5.18, the same word is used there and says, and do not get drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if the Bible says, do not get drunk with wine, why does this passage speak about drunkenness? Well, first of all, it, this passage does not say that people at this wedding were drunk. This passage says that the head waiter, the one who was really organizing everything here, the one who was to test the wine to make sure it was appropriate for the guests, he said he was describing a typical situation that happened at most weddings. He wasn't saying that this was the situation at this wedding. But even if there were some people at this wedding who were inebriated, which the text does not indicate, but if there were, the issue at hand in this story and the whole focus of this story is in no way saying that we should try to get people drunk. That was not the dilemma. The dilemma was how do we save this family from the social stigma and embarrassment of not doing a proper wedding ceremony. That was the concern of Mary, and this is what Jesus is responding to. Drinking alcohol is not and was not sin. Typically, people drank three types of wine in antiquity. There was undiluted fermented wine. In order to create wine, you know, there was no refrigeration. They didn't have preservatives that they added to wine. So any grape juice, any fruit juice, would naturally ferment. And as it fermented, the alcoholic content would increase. And so they would have three types. One would be undiluted fermented grape juice. And that undiluted fermented grape juice or fruit juice would usually take a minimum of three days, but up to two weeks. And different people preferred different fermentation processes. And so they would have a couple of weeks during the fermentation process, and then it would become wine. If it was undiluted, sometimes the scripture refers to that as strong drink, because the alcoholic content could be much higher. Much more common for the drink of wine was to separate diluted with water at a ratio of one to three. One part wine, three parts water. That was considered to be good wine. But there was cheaper wine, and wine was sometimes diluted at a 1 to 10 ratio. One part wine, 10 parts water. In fact, because water had bacteria and made people sick, oftentimes a little wine was added to normal water because they had figured out that the alcoholic content in wine purified the water and made it safer to drink. And there was less illness from people who practiced that than people who just drank the water straight. And so you have these three types of wine. You have undiluted wine, strong drink. You have one to three ratio, that's good wine, that's diluted wine. And then you have further diluted wine at a one to ten ratio. And you could see how people would sometimes bring the good wine out first, the one to three ratio, and then later bring out the one to ten ratio and hope that people don't notice. Wine could get you drunk. It's not that wine was always so diluted that nobody ever got drunk, and that's clear from Scripture as well. And while drinking alcohol is not sin and was not sin, it's important to notice that drunkenness 
is always considered to be sin in the Bible. And so when we come to a passage and people ask, well, what about alcohol? Should I drink alcohol? I just, I would ask, what is your motive to drink alcohol? For what reason are you doing? What is, what's going on in your heart? I'm not talking about blood alcohol level. I'm talking about what are you trying to experience? What is your motive? If your motive is for a feeling of inebriation, even a slight feeling, it is a wrong motive. And the Bible speaks of people who think that they won't get drunk, but they could just toy with it a bit as foolish. It says that wine is a mocker. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Listen, I have enough things that mock me in this life. Ice cream mocks me. It calls out from the freezer and says, finish me. So I have no need for other mockers. And I have endeavored to stay as far away from alcohol as possible. I do not want to add to scripture and be legalistic and say that it is wrong for someone to drink alcohol because that is not what the Bible teaches. But in a day and age where we have so many other options, I would challenge you from this text and from the scriptures and I would say, what is your motive? And if your motive is for the feeling or a closeness to something that resembles drunkenness, it's sin. Stay far away from it. We look at this passage, though, and we see that a miracle has taken place. And when I say a miracle, I mean a real miracle. I think people misunderstand the term miracle today. I think they misunderstand it because we use it so freely. I was at my sister's home last night. This morning I got into the shower in her guest room and, uh, and I, was, uh, I noticed that the, sh the shampoo that she had there was entitled Miracle Shampoo. And I came out and I asked my kids this morning, does my hair look miraculous? I wanted to hear the response. It looks nice, Dad. Way to go. There is no unnatural explanation for why my hair looks the way it does today. A miracle is something that does not have a natural explanation. A miracle is something that only has a supernatural explanation. A miracle is something that cannot be explained by natural means. Some people go to the grocery store or the shopping mall on a crowded day and the number one parking spot becomes available. You know what I'm talking about? That one, the closest one. It become, somebody pulls out just as you're pulling in and they say, it's a miracle. It's not a miracle. <laughs> it's providence. It's God's grace. It's his providence. It's not a miracle. There is a natural explanation for it. Miraculously, the wine that Jesus created did not have a fermentation process of 3 to 14 days. Miraculously, if the head waiter would have said, this is the best wine I've ever tasted. How long has it been fermenting? And if the waiter would have said, actually, it hasn't. <laughs> no, I don't believe it. What is the ratio? How many parts wine? How many parts water? water? The servant says, actually, I saw this whole process. It's one part water, zero parts anything else. <laughs> Impossible. No natural explanation. It is a miracle where something has been created not by natural means. This brings us to our third scene that directs our attention to the Lord over creation. Not only did he recognize the dilemma, not only did he respond to the dilemma, but he revealed his glory. He revealed his glory, verses 11 and 12. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. And after this, they went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. By performing this miracle at the wedding in Cana, Jesus semi-publicly revealed that he is the Messiah. 
At first glance, when we look at, it, it, look at this passage, it looks like the display of God's glory is what caused people to believe in him. It is not. It is, the miracle did not cause belief. You say, well, two statements are here. It does say that he manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. True. Both of those are true statements. But from the greater context of John's gospel and the New Testament, we learn that miracles are not what causes the faith in believers. Some of the disciples have already expressed belief in Jesus. Turn back to John chapter 1, verse 34. John the Baptist, who shared that he had direct revelation from God, pointed his disciples to Jesus as the Messiah. And John chapter 1, verse 34, John, said, John the Baptist says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Why? Because the God revealed that to him directly. The next day, two of Jesus' disciples spent an entire day with him. And it was after that event, in John chapter 1, verse 41, that Andrew declared, we have found the Messiah. And in verse 45 of John chapter 1, Philip and Nathanael said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so we have the words from some of his disciples that they believe they have found the one that was prophesied from the Old Testament. And it's Jesus of Nazareth. We have found him. Joseph is mentioned here, but it's just said that he's the son of Joseph. A common way of designating someone is mentioning their father, whether he was alive or dead. In addition to that, later in John's gospel, we see that many who saw his miracles, didn't believe in him. In fact, the servants saw the miracle. They witnessed the miracle of water turning into wine. And yet, we have nothing in this passage that indicates that they believed. They may have believed. They weren't with him in verse 12. Verse 12 tells us that his mother, his brothers were with him the next day. The disciples were with him. No servants. The servants didn't come with him. If this was the Messiah, the one who your entire life you had been prophesied, the one who the prophets had been silent for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, there was 400 years where there was no prophet, no word from God for the people of Israel. And the John the Baptist comes and tar starts telling people, the Messiah is coming, behold, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there's a great excitement. And then John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Messiah. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The servants see the miracle. Where are they? In fact, look at verse 23 and 24 of John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verse 23 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. That's good news. Observing his signs, which he was doing. He said, you see, they saw the signs and they believed. Verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. There you have another sub-theme in the Gospel of John, that all those who say they believe do not necessarily believe. There is a false belief, a belief that is not a genuine belief, a belief that says with their mouth or even in their head, yeah, I believe, it all makes sense. But in their heart, they have not entrusted themselves to him. Therefore, he does not entrust himself to them. There are many people today. Many people today who say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in the man upstairs. I believe that there's a creator. If they have not repented of their sins and turned and trusted in Christ as their Lord and Master, if they haven't come to the place where they say, I have no hope without you, everything I've been doing has actually been in rebellion against you, I hate my sin, I've embraced ideas, whether it be evolution or whatever, not because I necessarily believed in them, but because I wanted to harbor my own sin, but because I realized if I had to confess that you really existed, that, that I would have to also honor you and follow you. But there are some who do honor him with their lips and don't follow them, and they still think they're Christians, and they are not. 
Because the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. There's some say, well, I believe that Jesus is, is, is God. Is he your Lord? Have you confessed him as your Lord? Have you repented of your sin and turned and trusted in him? Because if you haven't, you're not a real Christian. John chapter 12, verse 13. The people took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. John chapter 12, verse 37. Though he had done many signs before him, they still did not believe in him. It makes sense, right? Miracles without divine explanation don't cause belief. What's the first thing somebody says when they see something that seems miraculous? I don't believe it. Miracles without divine explanation that is embraced and understood end up with doubt. People tend to run towards the sensational. They want to believe it. They try to separate their minds from it. Should never do that. God reveals himself in his word. Faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have doubts? It's common for believers to have doubt. Read his word. Study his word. Spend your life trying to prove this book wrong. Your faith will be built. If you have repented of your sins and trusted him as Lord, if his spirit is in you, your faith will only increase as you read his word, not decrease. Luke 16, 31, he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. What convinces people? Rich man and Lazarus? Would, would Lazarus's, would the rich man's uh, brothers believe if someone rise from the dead? No. If they don't... What we have in the word of God is actually better than if you saw a miracle because this produces saving faith. If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, neither would they believe if God raised him from the dead. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, and that's the world that we live in. We live in a world where people look at a tree and they say, I wonder how that tree got there. And they say, well, I know how it got there. Well, how? It's from a seed. Well, where did the seed came from? Well, it came from another tree. And where did that tree come from? Well, from another seed. And you go back and back, and you go seed, tree, seed, tree, seed, tree. At some point, you gotta have a seed without a tree or a tree without a seed. And people look at it and say, you know what? I'll just worship the tree. This is where we live, Romans 1. This is what the world is like. People love their sins so much that they'll say no one times nothing equals everything. That's how we all got here. What does God want you to take away from this passage? What's the application from this passage? So often we come to narratives, stories from the Bible. What do we learn from that? Now, as as Westerners, in Western culture, stories are often very man-centered. We tell people stories about the little boy who cried wolf. What's the moral of the story? Don't cry wolf, right? People try to do that to the scripture. You go hear a sermon today on the book of Jonah. You walk into nine out of ten churches around here, they're preaching on Jonah. The message is going to be entitled, Don't Be a Jonah. That's not the message of Jonah. The message of Jonah is God is a God of compassion. That's the theme of the book. Chapter 4 is all about compassion. God had compassion on the people of Nineveh, children who didn't know the right hand from the left. The word compassion is mentioned there twice. God's a God of compassion. The Hebrew narrative was designed to teach people about who God is. You read a story. You, you know, I'm telling you, you go to any, you, you, you just Google sermons on Daniel. Nine out of ten of them are going to be entitled something like, Dare to be a Daniel, which is great. I mean, Daniel was bold. Should we be bold? Yes, we should be bold. That's not the main message from Daniel. The message of Daniel is that God preserves his people even during a time of punishment. 
Daniel and his friends were carried off from their homes into captivity, into Babylon. But God was preserving his people, even during times of punishment, from God himself. We learn about God. What do we learn about God from the story of this passage? We learn that Jesus is God. And he could take nothing and make anything. In fact, if you go back to John chapter 1, verse 1, that's what John starts out saying. Look at verse 1 with me. Just, just look, take John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. Sounds a lot like what? Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, John chapter 1, verse 1, was the word... And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who was in the beginning with God? Skip down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the father. Full of grace and truth. The word is Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 1 again. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him nothing came into being. Has, has come into being. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ created wine out of water. How can could he do that? Because he is God. John wants you to see that Jesus is God. He is the same creator who made everything out of nothing. The world would want you to believe that there is no God because they want to hold on to their sin. So they've come up with all kinds of fanciful theories and gone to great lengths to try and true, prove them by right isotope, isotope ratio counting. But Romans, say, Romans 1 says that they're suppressing the truth. Why would they do that? Romans 1 says they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. They're holding it down because of their sin. If you haven't repented of your sin today and trusted to him, won't you do that today? Won't you believe that Jesus is God based off of the word of God? I pray that you will. And those of you who have done that, I want you to recognize that this is the first of his signs in the Gospel of John, which is another theme that runs itself through this Gospel. I'm priming the pump for all those who are to come and share the rest of these messages with you. But look at this. There are eight signs that John gives, seven prior to uh, the resurrection, one after the resurrection, eight signs. Jesus turns water into wine. Why? Because he is master over creation. Jesus heals an official's son. Not even, he's not even there. Why? Because he's the master over distance. Jesus heals a lame man on the Sabbath. Why? Because he's the master over time. God has been working up until now, and God never stops working. Jesus is God. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Why? Because he is the bread of life. Jesus walks on water and stills a storm. Why? Because he's master over all nature. Jesus heals a blind man. Why? Because he's the light of the world. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Why? Because he's master over death. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, causes an abundance of fish because he's the master over what he's created. And in our passage, we've seen the master of creation. And we've seen his glory revealed, just a glimpse of it. Just a semi-public glimpse of it, as recorded by an eyewitness. Imagine what his glory will be like one day, when it is fully revealed. I'll close, I'll share one of my favorite verses from John chapter 17. My mother passed away when I was 26. One of her favorite passages was this high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. And in this prayer, he says in verse 21, he says, Praise about the believers in the world. Verse 20 says, I do not ask on their behalf for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through, your, through their word. 
Verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be with us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may also be one, just as we are one. Can you imagine someday being apart from this world in the glory of God the Father, where not just a glimpse of it, but his complete glory is there, the glory that he longed for, the glory that he wanted to be reunited, the glory that he wants believers to be in. Charles Spurgeon commented on this passage, and he said to those who have lost people and who are grieving that loss, Spurgeon says this, Jesus prayed that those who belong to be but those that belong to him be with him where he is. We pray that those who belong to him be with us where we are. Whose prayer will win the day? Take comfort. We worship a God of glory. And we've seen a glimpse of that. We've seen a glimpse of that because he recognized the, a dilemma. He responded to the dilemma and he revealed some glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to look to it. We are so grateful to be able to study your truth. We give you all the praise and glory for anything that's accomplished here. And we, we come to you and knowing that you are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. And we are humbled by the fact, Father, that you would work within us. We are humbled because we are so undeserving. And if it weren't for your grace and for opening our eyes to see our terrible predicament because of sin and that we had no hope without you, that we would not have turned to you. And by grace, we've seen that and we worship you this morning. And so we praise you and we thank you and to you be all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.